Welcome to our worship today. There's a few notes just to share before we begin our time together. I uh, just want to say uh, thank you for Michael who stepped in at short notice to play the organ today for us. Um, and so just linked in with that, when it comes to the setting, uh, we will say uh, rather than sing. So we will say the Gloria and etc. Uh, we will say them, so just so you're aware of that. Uh, welcome to those who are watching uh, online at home. It's lovely that you can connect in worship with us as well. As we are all aware of the circumstances and the atrocities that are going on in Ukraine and in that area, I'm just going to read uh, very shortly uh, part of a letter that has been uh, prepared by the Archbishops of York and Canterbury and then I will say a prayer again that's just been prepared by the two archbishops and during which uh, Neil is going to light the paschal candle as a sign that Jesus is the light in the world, the Prince of Peace. So we should do that very shortly. I just want to say also that uh, the coffee morning is coming up on Friday as well, so do come and enjoy uh, a beverage uh, and a nice piece of cake. I know I'll be here to enjoy that as well. And also the new church magazine for March is uh, on its way around in the coming days as well. So do uh, enjoy reading what's uh, coming out, the information. So let me just read there again. This is part of the letter from the two archbishops. Dear sisters and brothers, there's a verse from John 14, verse 27. Peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you. I do not give to you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled, and do not let them be afraid. And then they go on to say, Many of us will have troubled hearts as we watch with horror the attack by Russia on Ukraine. As we have already said, this attack is an act of evil imperiling as it does the relative peace and security that Europe has enjoyed for so long. The attack by one nation on a free, democratic country has rightly provoked outrage, sanctions and condemnation. We lament with the people of Ukraine and we pray for the innocent, the frightened and those who have lost loved ones, homes and families. We continue to call for a ceasefire and the withdrawal of Russian forces, as well as wide-ranging efforts to ensure peace, stability and security. These events remind us powerfully that peace is precious and it is fragile. In chapter 14 of John's Gospel, Jesus speaks to his disciples at the Last Supper and he leaves them his peace. This is not a mere greeting, but rather something deep and abiding. This peace is something that only Jesus gives, which is a great gratuitous gift, a way of living, 
something to be received if the gift of peace is the gift of Jesus himself. That is why the Lord is able to offer reassurance to our hearts, why those who receive the gift of the peace of Jesus Christ at the deepest of levels should not be afraid. Peace, therefore, is so much more than the absence of war. It is a gift, and it is also a decision, a gift that must be received. It is a choice we make that shapes the way we live well alongside each other. It characterizes our relationship with God. The rest of that letter is outside on the porch and also available on the internet. And now let's just bow our heads as I say this prayer for Ukraine as we have the candle lit. God of peace and justice, we pray for the people of Ukraine today. We pray for peace and the laying down of weapons. We pray for all those who fear for tomorrow, that your spirit of comfort would draw near to them. We pray for those with power over war or peace wisdom, discernment and compassion to guide their decisions. Above all, we pray for all your precious children at risk and in fear, that you would hold and protect them. We pray in the name of Jesus, the Prince of Peace. Amen. to our first hymn which you'll find in our red hymn books so I invite to find number 192 192 praise my soul the king of heaven please do stand if you're willing and able be seated. So we turn to our orders of service. The second of the options. 
Grace, mercy, and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ be with you. And also with you. We say together, Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hidden, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. Our Lord Jesus Christ said, The first commandment is this. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is the only Lord. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. The second is this. Love your neighbor as yourself. There is no other commandment greater than these. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. Amen. Amen. Lord, Lord have mercy. God so loved the world that he gave his only son, Jesus Christ, to save us from our sins, to be our advocate in heaven, and to bring us to eternal life. Let us confess our sins in penitence and faith, firmly resolved to keep God's commandments and to live in love and peace with all. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, we have sinned against you and against our neighbour in thought and word and deed, through negligence, through weakness, through our own deliberate fault. We are truly sorry and repent of all our sins. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, who died for us, forgive us all that is past and grant that we may serve you in newness of life, to the glory of your name. Amen. <clears throat> Almighty God, who forgives all who truly repent, have mercy upon you, pardon deliver you from all your sins, confirm and strengthen you in all goodness, and keep you in life eternal, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. So I invite us to stand, and we will say the Gloria together. Glory to God in the highest, and peace to his people on earth. Lord God, heavenly King, almighty God and Father, we worship you, we give you thanks, we praise you for your glory. Lord Jesus Christ, only Son of the Father, Lord God, Lamb of God, you take away the sin of the world. Have mercy on us. You are seated at the right hand of the Father, Receive our prayer, for you alone are the Holy One, you alone are the Lord, you alone are the Most High, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit, in the glory of God the Father. Amen. And the collect today, Sunday next before Lent. Almighty Father, whose Son was revealed in majesty before he suffered death upon the cross, Give us grace to perceive his glory, that we may be strengthened to suffer with him and be changed into his likeness from glory to glory, who is alive and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Please be seated as we have our first reading. <coughs> reading from Corinthians 2, chapter 3, verses 12 to 18, and chapter 4, verses 1 and 2. Therefore, since we have had such hope, we are very bold. We are not like Moses, who would put a veil over his face to keep the Israelites from gazing at it, while the, whilst the radiance was fading away. But their minds were made dull, for to this day the same veil remains when the Old Covenant is read. 
It's not been removed because only in Christ is it taken away. Even to this day, when Moses is read, a veil covers their hearts. But whenever anyone turns to the Lord, the veil is taken away. Now the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. And we, who with unveiled faces all reflect the Lord's glory, are being transformed into his likeness with ever-increasing glory, which comes from the Lord, who is the Spirit. Therefore, since through God's mercy we have this ministry, we do not lose heart. Rather, we have renounced secret and shameful ways. We do not use deception, nor do we distort the word of God. On the contrary, by setting forth the truth plainly, we command ourselves to every man's conscience in the sight of God. This is the word of the Lord. So we come to our next hymn, which is number 96. Number 96, Bright the Vision that Delighted. Please do stand. Hear the Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to Luke. Glory, Glory to you, you o Lord. Lord. About eight days after Jesus said this, he took Peter, John and James with him and went up onto the mountain to pray. As he was praying, the appearance of his face changed 
and his clothes became as bright as a flash of lightning. Two men, Moses and Elijah, appeared in glorious splendor, talking with Jesus. They spoke about his departure, which he was about to bring to fulfillment at Jerusalem. Peter and his companions were very sleepy, but when they became fully awake, they saw his glory and the two men standing with him. As the men were leaving Jesus, Peter said to him, Master, it is good for us to be here. Let us put up three shelters, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. He did not know what he was saying. While he was speaking, a cloud appeared and enveloped them, and they were afraid as they entered the cloud. A voice came from the cloud saying, This is my son, whom I have chosen. Listen to him. When the voice had spoken, they found that Jesus was alone. The disciples kept this to themselves and told no one at that time what they had seen. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Praise, Praise to you, you, O Christ. Christ. To share our message today. Thank you. May the words of my mouth and the thoughts of all our hearts be acceptable to you, O Lord, our Rock and Redeemer. Amen. Please be seated. In our reading from 2 Corinthians today, Paul refers to the veiling of Moses' face, which shone after the old patriarch had been in the presence of God. Moses didn't realize that his face had become radiant because of this encounter. It's recorded in uh, chapter 35 of the book of Exodus, where it says, When Moses came down from the Mount Sinai with the two tablets of the testimony in his hands, he was not aware that his face was radiant because he had spoken with the Lord. When Aaron and all the Israelites saw Moses, his face was radiant, and they were afraid to come near him. But Moses called to them, so Aaron and all the leaders of the community came back to him, and he spoke to them. Afterwards, all the Israelites came near him, and he gave them all the commands the Lord had given him on Mount Sinai. When Moses finished speaking to them, he put a veil over his face. Whenever he entered the Lord's presence to speak with him, he removed the veil until he came out. And when he came out and told the Israelites what he had been commanded, they saw that his face was radiant. Then Moses would put the veil back over his face until he went in to speak with the Lord. The Apostle Paul is drawing a contrast, not between himself and Moses, but between Moses' hearers and his own. Moses failed to get through because the Israelites' hearts remained hardened against the glorious revelation. And Paul, an energetic messenger of the good news of God, is aware of the hardness of heart of many of his hearers. Perhaps we, being in the presence of God in our daily prayers, in that holy place of quiet, we are even more aware of our unholiness. But when God's Holy Spirit is free reign in our lives and we spend deep and precious time with the Lord, we can, indeed should, become transformed. We may not recognize it in ourselves, but unselfconsciously we display the Lord's brightness. Someone might remark on how different we have become. I must say here as an aside, what a pleasing change it is to see you all here with unveiled faces literally, and hopefully reflecting the Lord's light. Surely it's not stretching a point uh, too far to say that our encounters with the Lord in prayer and worship, in our daily walk with him, should cause the light of the Lord to shine from us. Not so much a physical brilliance, but a, a brightness in our character and disposition that should be evident uh, to all who meet us. 
the brightness is not created by just willing it or thinking ourselves better than we really are. In fact, as this comes from the Lord, our closer encounters with him means that we face our own failings more clearly and rely on his Holy Spirit within us to make us more like the people he wants us to be. Now, reading between the lines, as it were, I find it reassuring to find that Moses on the Mount of Transfiguration, because in the Old Testament, we see Moses never actually entered the Promised Land. It seemed rather sad, particularly considering all that he has endured in overseeing the, uh, the Israel in the wilderness with the grumbling refugees. Moses communes with God as he deals with numerous problems, but then, with the Promised Land in sight, he is deprived of the joy of entering the land of peace and plenty. We might think that that's the end for him, and yet, reassuringly, here he is, a heavenly, glorious, glowing appearance of Moses. I feel that this might be an encouragement to those who feel that uh, adverse conditions that have occurred to those we love seem so unfair. We may have lost loved ones prematurely in sad circumstances. Perhaps we can derive comfort from the example of Moses that after leaving this life prematurely and in disappointment with hopes dashed that once they have passed through the portal of death, they might, as Moses was, be brought into the fullness of God's blissful, eternal home. All the Gospel writers, by the way, follow the story of the Transfiguration with the story of the account of a boy who was desperately ill, so sick that the disciples had not been able to cure him. <coughs> so the, the apostles seem to be telling us that the two go together. A mountaintop experience, and then the shrieking, stubborn demon. Many people re prefer to live their lives without either, to be people of the plateau, undramatic and unexciting. But God seems to call some to that kind of life. But for many, spiritual experiences and Holy Spirit inspiration are balanced by huge demands. The more that we are open to God, the more we seem to be open to the pain of the world. When we return from some great worship experience or rise from a time of prayer in which God seemed particularly close and his love real and powerful, we have to realize that these things are never given for their own sake. They are to equip us so that God can use us in this needy world. Was the time of transfiguration for the sake of Jesus? or for his disciples, or for us, all of those perhaps. This was all part of Jesus' preparation for what lay in the future for him. Moses and Elijah were speaking with Jesus about his departure, which he was going to fulfill at Jerusalem. The word for departure is exodus. And Luke means us to understand that, that in several senses, uh, we can see it. It can mean like the exodus in the Old Testament, departure, going away, it can also serve as a euphemism for death, as when someone says, when I'm no longer here, referring to their own death. There's a parallel here between Moses and Jesus. Jesus will enact an event just like the great exodus from Egypt, only more so. In the first exodus, Moses led the Israelites out of slavery in Egypt and home to the promised land. And in the new exodus, Jesus will lead all God's people out of the slavery of sin and death and home to their promised inheritance, to the new creation of the redeemed. Luke intends us to draw the parallel in the transfigured faces of Moses and Jesus. Moses is here with Elijah, great representatives, the great lawgiver and the great prophet, symbol of God's covenant relationship with his people. The disciples were overwhelmed by the transfiguration. Peter blurts out the first thing that comes into his mind. But let us regard him kindly here, though. Don't we all feel a little overwhelmed when we're suddenly in the company of someone of distinction or in overwhelming circumstances, finding ourselves saying something stupid out of sheer nervousness? Peter wanted to keep Moses, Elijah, and Jesus there forever. But that simply was not God's purpose. They were unable to understand how it was that the glory which they had glimpsed on the mountain, the glory of God's chosen son, the servant who was carrying in himself the promise of redemption, would be finally unveiled 
on a very different hill outside Jerusalem. But to return to the Apostle Paul, writing of the veil that Moses wore when explaining the law to the people, claiming that a veil covered the hearts of his hearers as a rejection of the instructions that they were given by God. For us, the radiance of Christ lights up our life, inspiring us to live for him and to strive to follow his guidance. Sadly, it is all too possible for people to veil that radiance by sin and obstinacy. The Bible records the actions of kings and rulers over the, year, over the ages, many of whom were, as it were, had veiled their hearts against God's laws. Sadly, so on through history and to the present day, those choosing darkness, disaster, and devastation by their actions. Paul is speaking about those who deliberately choose to put a barrier between God and themselves. But the Spirit of Christ has written God's new covenant on the hearts of believers, giving them the light, the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. So Paul addresses a group of Christians with boldness and freedom because the glory of the gospel which he is revealing to them is shining back from his hearers. When they look at each other, they are gazing, as in a mirror, at the glory of the Lord. It is suggested that the icons that we see in the Orthodox tradition portraying many and various saints imbued with the Holy Spirit are therefore really all icons of Christ. I've known of people who have turned to Christ prompted by the joy they have seen in the lives of believers, particularly the Christians who have experienced hardship or great problems in their lives, but who, despite their setbacks, show forth the light of the Lord consistently. Like Moses, the Corinthians, and hopefully us, are unaware being glory bearers. Here then is part at least of the meaning of the transfiguration. This time the God whom Moses met on the mountain was the incarnate one on his way to accomplish the new exodus. This time the glory was to be put into action in challenging the forces of sickness and darkness. This time the word goes out to all people that this is my son, my chosen, listen to him hearts, lives, and perhaps even the faces of those who hear and obey will be transformed, whether they realize it or not. We, too, often find it completely bewildering to know how to understand all that God is doing and saying, both in our times of great joy and in our times of great sadness. But the word that comes to us, leading us to follow Jesus, Jesus even when we are confused about what is going on, is the word that came from the cloud on that strange day in Galilee and which echoes also the voice from heaven at his baptism which was this is my son my chosen one listen to him Thank you, Neil. Great encouragement there for us to be transformed through our faith, which in turn seeks to transform others in how we live our lives as followers of Jesus Christ. So thank you very much, Neil, for sharing today. We now come to the creed, so I invite you to stand, if you're able, and we say this statement of faith and belief together. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, 
the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten not made, of one being with the Father, through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, was incarnate from the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and was made man. For our sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day he rose again, in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy, Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Please do be seated. We have a time of intercession. this time of intercession we'll use the second response so when i say lord hear us please respond with lord graciously hear us lord hear us lord graciously hear us heavenly father you know what is on our hearts and minds and this time we particularly pray again for the situation in Ukraine and the surrounding region. We pray for Christians in Ukraine as they meet in different ways, in underpasses, in cellars, At this time we continue to pray for our brothers and sisters in Christ who are persecuted because of their Christian faith in you. We pray for Christians in Afghanistan, the hardest place in the world to be a Christian, extreme persecution. We pray for Christians in Nigeria who experience much the most violence because of their faith. Particularly in Nigeria, we pray for the government, we pray for the security, and we pray for protection, particularly of children in schools, for Christian women and girls. Also remembering, continue to pray for Christians in North Korea where to even hold a Bible can mean arrest and disappearance. But yet we thank you, even through these extreme pressures, that your church is growing. People are coming to faith, and we thank you for this. And we continue to pray for open doors. The Christian charity supported the persecution church. We thank you for all that Brother Andrew did in being obedient to you, going behind the Iron Curtain, originally to bring Bibles to those desperate to have one. And this time we pray for the safety of those who work for open doors, who provide resources of medical, Christian literature and education, and food for those in need. Lord, hear us. Lord, graciously hear us. Heavenly Father, leadership is a privilege, but yet a responsibility. Lord, our heart sinks when those in leadership make ill-advised judgments and decisions. We pray for the leadership of the government in Russia. 
we particularly pray for the opposition parties that they will have freedom and not be arrested to quell any opposition to the rule in Russia. Lord, we pray for Vladimir Putin. Lord, we pray that your Holy Spirit will work through him and he'll come to a sense of mind to reverse decisions that have been made and the evil that is currently taking place. Lord, hear us. Lord, graciously hear us. Heavenly Father, we pray for those who represent us nationally, regionally and locally. Also pray for Her Majesty the Queen. We thank you for her reign. We thank you for her Christian faith. In this year of celebration, we pray for her health and well-being. Lord, hear us. Lord, graciously hear us. Lord, we pray for the well. The opportunity to reach out to those who yet know you, don't yet know you. We pray for the well meeting this afternoon in Ingleshall. We thank you for your provision. We thank you for your vision. We continue to pray for your Holy Spirit's prompting and protection as we seek to step out in faith for you. May your blessing be upon it and those involved and those who come in the time ahead. Lord, hear us. Lord, graciously hear us. Lord, we pray for those who are suffering at this time those who are grieving. We do particularly pray for our sister Maggie. She grieves the loss of her daughter Sammy. We pray for her and the family. May they know your peace, your love and your comfort at this time. Lord, hear us. Lord, graciously hear us. Heavenly Father, we pray for those who are unwell at this time or finding life a challenge. Continue to pray for Tony in intensive care. Pray for Bob Harris in hospital. And continue to pray for many others who able to share out in public if we just take this moment where we can bring before the Lord quietly in our hearts those we know who we wish to pray for at this time Lord, hear us. Lord, graciously hear us. And finally, an opportunity to bring to God, just again, quietly in our hearts, our own personal petitions of prayer. Merciful Father, accept these prayers for the sake of your Son, our Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen. We now come to our next hymn, which is number 261. That's 261, once, only once, and once. Please do stand if you're willing and able.
continue on page nine in our orders of service. Blessed you, Lord God of all creation. Through your goodness we have this bread set before you, which earth has given and human hands have made. It will become for us the bread of life. Blessed, Blessed be, be God, God forever. Blessed are you, Lord God of all creation. Through your goodness we have this wine to set before you. Fruit of the vine and work of human hands. It will become for us the cup of salvation. Blessed, Blessed be, be God, God forever. The Lord is here. His Spirit is with us. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give thanks to grace. Blessed are you, Lord God, our light and our salvation. To you be glory and praise forever. From the beginning you have created all things, and all your works echo the silent music of your praise. In the fullness of time, you made us in your image, the crown of all creation. You give us breath and speech, that with angels and archangels and all the powers of heaven, we may find a voice to say your praise. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he O oh, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Hosanna in the highest. Please do be seated. How wonderful the work of your hands, O oh Lord. As a mother tenderly gathers her children, you embrace the people as your own. When they turned away and rebelled, your love remained steadfast. From them you raised up Jesus our Saviour, born of Mary, to be the living bread, in whom all our hungers are satisfied. He offered his life for sinners, and with a love stronger than death, he opened wide his arms upon the cross. On the night before he died, he came to supper with his friends, and taking bread, he gave you thanks, he broke it and gave it to them, saying, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. At the end of supper, taking the cup of wine, he gave you thanks and said, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Great is the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. Father, we plead with confidence his sacrifice made once for all upon the cross. We remember his dying and rising in glory, and we rejoice that he intercedes for us at your right hand. Pour out your Holy Spirit as we bring before you these gifts of your creation. May they be for us the body and blood of your dear Son. As we eat and drink these holy things in your presence, form us in the likeness of Christ and build us into a living temple to your glory. Bring us at the last with all the saints to the vision of that eternal splendor for which you have created us through Jesus Christ our Lord, by whom, with whom, and in whom, with all who stand before you in earth and heaven, we worship you, Father Almighty, in songs of everlasting praise. Blessing and honor and glory and power be yours for ever and ever. Amen. And we skip over a couple of pages to page 14. That's page 14. As our Saviour taught us, so we pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins, 
as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. We break this bread to share in the body of Christ. Though we are many, we are one body, because we all share in one bread. On the right-hand side of the page, we say together, Jesus, Lamb of God, have mercy upon us. Jesus, bearer of our sins, have mercy upon us. Jesus, Redeemer of the world, grant us peace. Draw near with faith, receive the body of our Lord Jesus Christ, which he gave for you, and his blood which he shed for you. Eat and drink in remembrance that he died for you, and feed on him in your hearts by faith with thanksgiving. And we say the prayer together. We do not presume to come to your table, merciful Lord, trusting in our own righteousness, but in your manifold and great mercies. We are not worthy so much as to gather up the crumbs under your table, but you are the same Lord, whose nature is always to have mercy. Grant us therefore, gracious Lord, so to eat the flesh of your dear Son, Jesus Christ, and to drink his blood, that our sinful bodies may be made clean by his body, and our souls washed through his most precious blood, and that we may evermore dwell in him, and he in us. Amen. Surely do come forward to receive, and if you prefer to receive a prayer of blessing, just have your hands by your side, but please do come and receive.
in a special post-communion prayer. Holy God, we see your glory in the face of Jesus Christ. May we who are partakers at his table reflect his life in word and deed, that all the world may know his power to change and save. This we ask through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. the bottom of page 16, invite to join together in the prayer. Almighty God, we thank you for feeding us with the body and blood of your Son, Jesus Christ. Through him we offer you our souls and bodies to be a living sacrifice. Send us out in the power of your Spirit to live and work to your praise and glory. Amen. So invite to stand as we come to the blessing Final hymn. The peace of God which passes all understanding. Keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and of his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. And the blessing of God Almighty the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be among you and remain with you always. Amen. So we come to our final hymn, which is number 207. That's 207. Praise the Lord, the Almighty, the King of creation. final dismissal just two things just to mention ash wednesday is on wednesday this coming wednesday and there'll be a service at seven o'clock here this evening 
uh, also beginning Lent, but also during that time, we'll be praying for Ukraine as well. So that's this Wednesday at seven o'clock here in church. And again, also just like to say thank you again for Michael for stepping in to play the organ uh, this morning for us. The dismissal. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord. In the, in the name, name of Christ. Christ. Amen. Amen.